Good afternoon. I'm Carrie Abrams, the Dean of Duke Law School, and I'm so glad to be welcoming you all to today's panel, where we are after the 2020 election. As we all know, we're in the midst of a moment unlike any other in our country's history. Just over a week ago, the presidential election was called for former Vice President Joe Biden. And yet, as of today, President Donald Trump has not conceded. Instead, the president's lawyers have filed lawsuits challenging the election process in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, the post-election transition process, whereby the outgoing administration prepares to transfer power to the incoming one, has yet to formally begin. Some of the issues surrounding this unusual situation are purely political. Many, however, have legal components to them that are worth analyzing to understand the role law plays in elections and transition. We also need to consider the effects of this particular election and transition on the rule of law and the future of our democratic institutions. To help us think through these issues, we have invited a very distinguished panel of experts from law schools across the country to join us today. Before introducing our panel, I have a few thank yous to offer. First, this event is sponsored and planned by the Duke Law Dean's Office and the Program in Public Law. The Program in Public Law is one of Duke Law School's most long-standing signature programs with the mission of promoting better understanding of our nation's public institutions, of the constitutional framework in which they function, and of the principles and laws that apply to the work of public officials. This year, the program's faculty director is Professor Marin Levy, and I want to thank her for planning this event and especially for continuing to revise the details of the event up until the last few days so that we could be responding to the current situation as it has evolved. I also want to thank our wonderful staff, including Laura Grisham, Miguel Bordo, and especially Rachel Faraby of the Dean's Office for organizing the logistics of the event and helping to make it go so smoothly. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our very distinguished panel. First, we have Bertral Ross, the Chancellor's Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley Law School. Professor Ross is also a member of the Diversity and Democracy Cluster within the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. Next, we will be joined by Professor Kate Shaw of the Cardozo School of Law. Professor Shaw co-directs the Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy and has recently written about the presidential transition. We will then hear from Professor Jack Goldsmith, the Harry L. Shattuck Professor of Law at Harvard University. Professor Goldsmith is also the author, along with Bob Bauer, of After Trump, Reconstructing the Presidency, just released this fall. Finally, we are joined by Mila Versteg, Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. Professor Versteg is also the director of UVA's Human Rights Program and of the Center for International and Comparative Law. This panel discussion will be moderated by our own Guy Charles, the Edward and Ellen Schwartzman Professor of Law and director of the Duke Law Center on Law, Race, and Politics. I want to thank you all for participating in today's event. With that, Professor Charles, I will hand things over to you. Thank you, Dean Abrams. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, welcome this distinguished group of scholars um, to Duke Law School virtually and to have them share with us their expertise on how to think about this current electoral moment in which we find ourselves. Um, each of them will take five to 10 minutes and present their perspective and their views. We're gonna start with Professor Ross, then followed by Professor Shaw, and then Professor Goldsmith, and then Professor Versteeg. Uh, and then after they've presented their perspectives and their views for a few minutes, then we will take the time and spend the next, the last 10 to 15 minutes uh, taking questions and we'll end promptly at 125. If you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat and I'll do my best to pass it on to the panelists. So without further ado, let me now turn things over to Professor Ross. 
Thank you, Professor Charles, and, and thank you, Dean Abrams and Professor Levy for having me here, or at least having me here virtually, and to my co-panelists for allowing me to participate with you. So, you know, this election has been a roller coaster ride um, for a person who hates roller coaster. Um, it's endless and it's not particularly fun. President Trump previewing this anxious moment said before the election that he would acknowledge defeat, he would only acknowledge defeat if the election was free and fair. Now, many, including myself, interpreted Trump as saying that he would not recognize an election as free and fair unless he won. And President Trump lost. And what has followed is the president's challenge to the legitimacy of the election. And this challenge comes despite the extraordinary success of this election. This election was run during a pandemic that has killed thousands and thousands of Americans. Um, and this has required an adjustment to new forms of voting in states throughout the country, with a particular adjustment to mail-in voting in states that had little experience with massive forms of mail-in voting. And in many states, these adjustments did not go particularly well in the primaries. And yet the states managed to pull it off in the general election. Now, despite some efforts at voter suppression that should not be forgotten, turnout numbers were the highest since the beginning of the 20th century. And there were very few reports of problems with mail-in balloting, early voting, or election day voting. This is truly remarkable to pull off such a successful election in the pandemic. Yet this pres presidential election will still end up being the most litigated presidential election in history, at least in terms of the number of lawsuits filed. And the litigation barrage started before the election when the Trump campaign and Republicans challenged state executive orders and federal and state court rulings loosening the deadline for receipt of ballots because of challenges arising from the pandemic and the mail slowdown at the United States Postal Service. The orders and rulings in Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina mandating the counting of ballots that are postmarked by election day and yet and that were received uh, within a certain numbers of days after, after the election. Um, um, these um, rules were challenged and the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the federal court ruling that provided for this change in Minnesota. But these changes were permitted in Pennsylvania and North Carolina with the Pennsylvania adjustment reaching the Supreme Court with a divided court rejecting a stay and upholding the Pennsylvania Supreme Courts permitting the adjustment and allowance for um, ballots to be received that were postmarked by election day and counted by that were postmarked by election day. Now during the election, the litigation focus shifted to the transparency of the ballot counting process. It is during this litigation that we started to see a divergence um, that my election law colleague Jessica Levinson has described between re what Republicans and the Trump campaigns were filing in court and what they were saying in public. Now, what they were filing in court <coughs> were, <coughs> excuse me, were small board complaints that a pizza box in a particular corner of a ballot counting facility blocked observers' views from the counting process. <laughs> what they were that what they were uh, what which was the pizza box the purpose of the pizza box was to prevent the photographing the illegal photographing of ballot counters and ballots and in some Pennsylvania facilities um, observers were required to stand further away than they wanted for health and safety reasons yet in public the Trump campaign and his Republican supporters claimed that Republican observers were entirely excluded from the ballot counting process that they suggested occurred in back rooms that were hotbeds for fraud in court, every suit except one was dismissed because of the lack of evidence that even the small obstructions alleged that, that were alleged impeded the ability of Republican observers to observe the ballot counting process. And the only small victory that, the, that Republicans were able to achieve um, were, was in Pennsylvania when, when a court allowed election observers to stand a little closer to ballot counters. Post-election, we have seen law, a lawsuit flurry based mostly on unproven and frankly baseless allegations of election irregular, irregularities and fraud. Thus far, we have seen two results from these lawsuits, court dismissal or withdrawal of the suit. And in a few of the ongoing matters, we have seen major law firms withdraw from representing the Trump campaign in these lawsuits, probably recognizing that the claims that they are advancing in court are borderline sectionable due to their frivolity. But even if there were a factual basis for these lawsuits, the other problem for the Trump campaign is that almost all of them involve too few votes to matter in overturning the election result in any state. And all the lawsuits in combination would not impact enough votes to overturn the election nationwide. So what is behind the litigation madness? There are three, <clears throat> excuse me, there are three potential theories that I wanna proffer here. One theory is that the Trump campaign is, is trying to, what the, Trump campaign is trying to do is flood the courts with doo-doo, doo-doo lawsuits to delay state election certification. 
If states are unable to certify their election results by December 8th, then the state legislature can declare a failed election and then under the Federal Electoral Count Act appoint whatever slate of electors they choose. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Arizona all have Republican controlled legislatures. And if a combination of states representing at least 37 electoral college votes go along with this gambit, then President Trump will have successfully stolen the election. I think that this is highly, highly improbable as I do believe that most Americans and most Republicans have too much respect for the will of the people to blatantly destroy our democracy in such a way. Or if that optimism is misplaced, I think that Republicans understand the huge ramifications of such a decision for them in the institutions they represent and would shy away from it for that reason. Now, second theory is that this is all about delegitimizing Biden in the way that Republicans believe the, the Democrats delegitimize Trump. It is a partisan tit for tat. Associated with this theory is a Trumpian political self-interest. Soon after the election, Trump started fundraising for a new Save America PAC. In the minds of Trump, it appears, the notion that America needs saving requires that there be what Trump referred to in the 2016 inaugural address, American carnage. And a path to securing American carnage is to obstruct and sabotage the future Biden campaign so that Trump or his chosen successor can return to power in 2024. If successful, this strategy will mark the end of hope for functional democracy in the federal government. A third theory is that this is just about stroking Trump's e ego and raising the cost for civilly and criminally prosecuting him after the election. I don't believe that Biden will ever make any sort of deal with Trump to not pursue federal investigations of Trump. And I don't think that Trump will engage in any sort of self-pardon or resign and allow Vice President Pence to pardon him. But of course, I could be wrong. What I think is the most, more likely strategy is that in the face of doubts from some Americans about whether Biden is legitimately in the White House and Trump legitimately lost the election, it would be politically costly to investigate and prosecute a former contestant to an election, even if those investigations and prosecutions are entirely proper. Now, these are theories behind sort of the litigation madness. Um, it's hard to make sense of litigation on its own because they are, the, the lawsuits are so weak and lack factual or legal basis to them. But there are possibilities for this litigation strategy that could uh, secure benefits for President Trump um, and potentially Republicans in the future. So we'll see where these go. Um, but let me, for now, just pass the mic over to Professor Shaw. Thank you, Patrol. And now let us turn it over uh, to Professor Kate Shaw. Sorry, I had an, uh, an issue starting my video, but I think we're good now. Okay, so thank you so much to Dean Abrams and to professors Charles and Levy for including me in this group. Um, and uh, I thought Professor uh, Ross gave a terrific overview of the sort of uh, state of play with respect to this litigation. So I'm mostly gonna talk about transition issues, but um, I did wanna make one observation, which is I think it's really um, astute to sort of think about the kind of strategy that underlies this litigation effort. I think that the depiction of many of these lawsuits has been um, somewhat kind of light and almost comedic in tone because there is so little fact or law that supports many of them. Um, but I do think that there is a coherent strategy and I'm not sure which of the potential theories best explains the strategy, but I think it is important to take seriously as strategy, uh, this wave of lawsuits. Um, and I just wanted to make one comment on the kind of potential theory that this is that, that the effort here was really about either exposing enough issues or just causing enough delay and sowing enough confusion um, that you might end up in a world in which um, a presumably Republican legislature of you know, one or more states uh, might be persuaded that it could invoke a provision of the Electoral Count Act that does allow uh, whenever any state has failed to make a choice on the day prescribed by law, uh, the legislature to appoint electors in such manner, manner as the legislature uh, may direct. And I just wanna sort of underscore that in addition to the political um, um, and kind of sovereignty problems with the legislature interceding in this fashion to directly appoint electors um, in a way that is different or a group of electors that is different from the group that has been selected by the voters of the state, um, I think is again, not only problematic broadly speaking, but extremely difficult to justify even under the statutory provision that would presumably provide the basis for such uh, an intervention by a legislature. Um, it really is designed for the kinds of emergency circumstances in which a state just hasn't been able to hold an election or where an 
election has been so fatally corrupted um, that there just cannot be a winner discerned. And, in, and you know, we should say it's not a provision that has ever been invoked. And I think that the possibility of this kind of set of steps being taken by a state legislature is an idea that has migrated in what I think is a pretty dangerous way from a very off the wall idea over the course of the last few months to something that looks potentially on the wall. Um, and so I do think it's important to underscore that although there is a statutory provision that would provide the ostensible basis for such a move, um, it is not only, I think, a stretch of the statutory text itself, um, but certainly inconsistent with the basic idea that once, once a legislature, although it has the constitutional power to make uh, any number of different decisions about how to appoint its electors. Once a legislature has given that power to the citizens of its state, as every legislature since the 1870s has, has done, um, it cannot, after an election, um, revoke that decision, right, which has been, again, uh, created consistent with state law um, without undermining the right to vote, due process, other kinds of constitutional values. So I, I just wanted to sort of make that point. Okay, so on to transitions. So two weeks after the election, 10 days after the results of the election became clear and uh, the election was called, we are in the midst of some sort of transition, but it is obviously not a typical transition. So let me talk for a couple of minutes about transitions generally, uh, and then what I view as some of the questions, the important questions that we're facing right now. So transitions are kind of a constitutional no man's land, right? Um, both outgoing and incoming presidents are fond of intoning this refrain that we have one president at a time, um, and that is, you know, as a technical constitutional matter, true, there is no, the president-elect is not in the constitution. The president remains the president until noon on January 20th. Um, but both practice and the legal framework that surrounds transitions um, are a lot more complicated than that. The president-elect is clearly not just some private citizen waiting in the wings. Um, it was the case once upon a time that transitions were pretty informal affairs in which the president-elect, you know, took a long vacation and then set about picking a cabinet and that was basically it. Um, but, you know, transitions over our history and in particular over the course of the last half century or so have become increasingly formalized, increasingly structured, and increasingly bounded by law. So the big framework statute here uh, is the Presidential Transition Act, uh, first enacted in 1963 and amended a number of times uh, since. Um, and it gives a president-elect and the operation that surrounds him um, access to a lot of the resources of the federal government. Uh, things like office space, uh, funds, um, uh, today north of $9 million in funds for staff and supplies and travel for experts and things of that nature access to security clearances um, and briefings for the president-elect, well, briefings for the president-elect, security clearances for staff members, compiled briefing books, access to both the physical spaces and the intellectual resources of the federal agencies, detailees, so temporary workers on loan from agencies to the transition. Uh, and most of that is not presently available to Biden as president-elect. Um, and why? That's because all of this is available to the president-elect only when the administrator of the GSA makes an ascertainment of the identity of the apparent winner of the election. So the statute, the Presidential Transition Act talks about the president-elect and the definition section um, defines the president-elect and the vice president-elect as um, the individuals who are the apparent winners of the election as ascertained by the GSA administrator. So the GSA is basically the landlord of the federal government, right? provides office spaces, supplies, IT, other kinds of support to federal agencies and federal workers. Um, and the GSA administrator clearly doesn't have the power to make any ultimate determination of the identity of the winner of a federal election under federal law or the constitution or anything else, but she holds the keys to the resources of transition. Um, and so far she has failed to make the ascertainment that is a prerequisite essentially to unlocking all of the resources uh, of transition, uh, or I should say most of the resources of transition. Now, these ascertainments are typically uncontroversial affairs. The big exception to that was in 2000, um, when the GSA administrator did not make the ascertainment until after the Supreme Court had resolved Bush versus Gore on December 12th, and then after El Gore had publicly conceded on December 13th, only then was the ascertainment made. And the administrator was roundly criticized at the time, and I think that all of those criticisms apply with even more force today when there truly is no basis um, for delaying this kind of ascertainment. And indeed, the administrator has made no public explanation of the reasons for her uh, delay. So we are left to speculate that it is presumably because the president continues to pursue this clearly doomed uh, litigation strategy. Um, let me just make a couple more quick points. So uh, even though these, you know, all these resources are not yet available to the president-elect uh, and his team, um, the successive amendments to the Presidential Transition Act have 
you know, both expanded the scope of transition, but also have changed the deadlines that's around transition. So it's actually the case that transitions start a lot earlier than the day after the general election. Um, so indeed, after there is a, you know, when there's you know, not an incumbent running, when there are two major party candidates, following the conventions, actually, kind of a phase of transition is kicked into gear um, and office spaces become available. Um, email addresses with government, you know, .gov domains become available. Um, interim or the paperwork for beginning and, and potentially even granting interim security clearances so that those clearances have already been granted by the time the actual next phase of the transition kicks into gear. So all of that is actually underway. Um, there's a memorandum of understanding that was signed between Biden and the GSA on September 1st that is supposed to expire either when there's a, an apparent winner of the election or until such date as the ascertainment has been made. So that MOU that again provides some of these resources um, to the Biden team remains in effect even um, with this delay in the formal ascertainment. But I should say that the delay, so the delay does not mean there is no actual transition underway, like not at all, um, but it does mean that many of the resources remain unavailable uh, to the Biden team. The ones that to me are the most concerning are those that involve uh, national security matters. And I very much include kind of preparation for pandemic response, for assuming pandemic response, uh, vaccine distribution plans. All of those things are, you know, it is required in order to actually begin to make headway um, on all of those matters, to begin to have conversations with, meetings with, review the documents produced by uh, government officials in places like HHS, the CDC, NIH, uh, and other entities. I think there actually is some gray in the law regarding whether those meetings could begin even prior to this ascertainment, but there has been reporting that there have been directives issued inside government um, to, to not begin to undertake such meetings and exchanges until the ascertainment has been made. And if that is true, then none of that is happening. And I think that is deeply concerning, again, both from the perspective of the pandemic um, and kind of national security uh, more broadly. So I'll stop there um, and I'll look forward to the discussion and Q&A. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, now let us turn to Professor Jack Goldsmith. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear thanks. you. Thank you. So thanks very much for inviting me today. Um, I'm very grateful to be here and be asked to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I about what I think is going on transition, uh, and I agree largely with the speakers that came before me. Um, let me start off by agreeing with uh, Professor um, Professor Ross about how about how fairly successful this election was. I think this is vitally important to understand we had there were historic problems potential problems in this election and it was hugely successful by almost any measure uh, and one um, element of fear that professor ross didn't mention was foreign disinformation or foreign interference which by all accounts seems not to have occurred so in this moment of anxiety i think we should and in, and in a time when there's a worry about our, our the institutions of our constitutional democracy working I think in the face of these extraordinary um, difficulties, the election was remarkably successful. Um, so what is President Trump up to? I mean, what he's doing now basically is what he's done for four years. He is, his actions in, in making claims about uh, false claims, mendacious claims about fraud in the election and that he won and the like, they don't violate any law as far as I can tell. And mostly what Trump's greatest abuses as president were not law violations. They were doing things like this that were attacking institutions, undermining institutions. Why does he do it is a, one of the great puzzles of, of the last four, four years. Uh, but it, among other reasons that he does it is because he is relentlessly focused, obviously, on his personal interests at the, and I think also his interests both in discrediting the Biden administration before it comes in and uh, in setting himself up for whatever he plans to do after the election, uh, whether that means if he's trying to secure his base, trying to raise money, trying to make it harder for the Biden administration to investigate and prosecute him, I don't know. But it is terribly dangerous. To my mind, there's been lots of claims about constitutional crises and the like for the last four years, which I thought were somewhat overblown. And I don't think we're in a constitutional crisis at all right now. But I do think what President Trump is doing now may be the worst thing he's done. It goes to the absolute heart of our constitutional democracy. He clearly lost the election. My view is that he's allowed to play out these uh, lawsuits, uh, which don't seem to be going anywhere. Um, 
And it seems to me, I'm not an election law expert like other people on this panel, but it seems to me that if we step back just a bit, that as Professor, as Professor Ross Singh seemed to be on track for Joe Biden being president on January 20th. Um, so I do worry a little bit more, I think, about some of the problems that can arise during the transition in addition to Trump uh, undermining confidence in the election and, and undermining confidence in the Biden administration for a big chunk of the country, which is no small thing at all. Um, I think that this is the most dangerous period because Trump has even less to lose now in the next six or eight weeks and lots of presidential power, hard presidential power that he could exercise in various ways. So the things I worry about, uh, I, I'm not sure I agree with Professor Ross. I'm more worried than Professor Ross about Tr President Trump wielding the pardon power in very, very aggressive ways. I think it's more likely than not that he will issue a self-pardon. I don't know why he wouldn't. He's he said he wouldn't once about two years ago when he claimed to have the power, but um, it, it might bring him a legal advantage later and it's the kind of thing he would do. But in any event, it, I would be shocked if he didn't exercise the pardon power in very broad ways to pardon uh, members of his family, members of his administration who may face legal jeopardy, the Trump organization and all of its employees that are under investigation, investigation in federal. I think we're going to see massive uh, abuses of the pardon power in the next five or six weeks. There's not much that can be done about these. The, the self-pardon of the president is, it's not clear where that, whether that is allowed under Article 2. It's never been tried. Scholars are split on that. But when it comes to pardoning other, um, other officials uh, or other people, uh, the pardon power is enormously broad. Um, we talk in our, Bob Bauer and I talk in our recent book about some reforms that Congress might be able to make after the election to the pardon power. Uh, those wouldn't apply to and limit Trump. It's conceivable under current law, although I think it's a hard case to make. Uh, well, I would just say it's, there's a decent case to make under current law that the president cannot offer a pardon in exchange for obstruction of justice or, or, or uh, in exchange for someone who may have withheld testimony. He cannot uh, exercise the pardon power, arguably, in, in acceptance of a bribe. Other than that, though, uh, presidents have enormous discretion under the pardon power. And um, this is the time during transitions when past presidents have done the most aggressive and controversial pardons. And uh, I expect Trump to do that probably much more so in ways we can't even imagine, not just for his circle, but in other ways uh, for the shock value. Other things I worry about during the transition, and again, these are not about legality. Uh, these are things that the president has the power to do. Um, there's by power, I mean both the legal power and the ability. So I worry very much that he will be more aggressive in trying to incite violence during this period. That's certainly a concern. Uh, I think there's a, there's been a lot of stories about uh, Trump disclosing national security secrets. This is a president who has disclosed very important national security secrets just out of kind of indiscipline or showing off um, in the past. And now during this period, especially since he has a big bone to pick with the intelligence agency, uh, we can expect him, I think, to disclose, to declassify all sorts of secrets that he think may he thinks may put him in a better light um, with regard to Russia. He may disclose classified secrets that uh, may uh, bring harm to China. We don't know, but I ex what he might do, but I expect that he will do what he's done before, except more aggressively, and use this waning power that he has in ways that are self-serving to himself and destructive of his enemies as he perceives it. Um, I think that there's, we should seriously worry about um, the president's emergency powers and war powers, which are very hard powers, very broad powers. There was a story, I think it was in this morning's paper about how the president um, was asking for options about bombing Iran. Uh, this is the kind of thing I worry that Trump will try to do uh, uh, in the waning days of his presidency, since he can. Uh, I think there's also an effort. Uh, he's also, and people may differ their views on this, uh, but he's trying to uh, bring home the troops from Afghanistan and the Middle East, or at least seriously reduce those uh, th those forces. Whether that's a good or bad thing, I think that's something that appears he's going to try to do. He could use his emergency powers to try to ratchet up uh, the pain on China even more in, in ways that might become dangerous. 
And finally, finally, I think he uh, can engage. He's already in, fired several people, senior officials, including the Secretary of Defense and the Defense Department, and manipulated um, uh, am ambiguities or, or uh, uh, gaps in the vacancies law, or, or shortcomings, I should say, in the vacancies law to put his uh, um, loyalists in those positions, especially in the undersecretary slots. It's not clear why Trump is doing that. Does this relate to intelligence disclosure? Does this relate to pulling back the troops? Does it relate to something more nefarious? It's not clear, but I expect to see many more firings during the interim period um, and not to, and the placement of loyalists in those positions in the waning weeks. Not clear what that will lead to, but I do think it's worrisome. So I'm going to stop there. I mean, I've written this book about how to reform the presidency after Trump, but I think we're focused here on the transition. And I'll just underscore and say that I think this is the most dangerous period of the Trump presidency. Jack, I thank you for scaring the living daylights out of me. I appreciate it. I will now go crawl into my bunker for the moment. Um, but I hope that Professor Miller Stieg um, will provide some comfort. Uh, I'll try. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's obviously an honor. Uh, I should say I'm not an election law scholar, uh, but I'm a comparativist, so I study other countries. And I wanted to basically take a step back and reflect on what, what if anything, other countries or the comparative exper experience have to tell about this particular moment that we're in. So it's by way of background, it's worth mentioning that ever since Trump came to power, comparativists have been particularly worried about Trump and some of the things he said and done. Uh, and the reason is that it's been fairly well documented that the way autocracy happens these days is auto autocrats, they don't come to power anymore through coup d'etats. No, they get elected. Uh, and, but once they're in power, they will start using the state apparatus to gradually undermine checks and balances and, and democratic institutions, often in the name of the people, right? So they will pack the courts or strip their jurisdiction. They will delegitimize the opposition and treat them as the mortal enemy, using the state apparatus to bully them if they can. Uh, they delegitimize or capture in the independent media, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but importantly, these countries, they still kind of look like democracies. They hold elections. It just becomes a little bit harder to, uh, to win these elections. Uh, and these leaders, they don't usually openly defy the constitution or the law. Instead, they play with it. They reinterpret it, they amend it, they make it work in their, uh, in their favor. Uh, and, and, and also what the literature has been documenting is that there's a number of countries that used to be mature democracies that have gradually moved in this sort of autocratic direction. So notable examples include Hungary or Poland or Turkey. Uh, and the literature has further said, well, all these guys, I'm sorry, they're all guys, uh, they, have, they, ha they have pretty similar moves. There is a bit of a playbook that they use to get there, right, to take to erode democracy in these places. Uh, and many have worried that Trump would take the US down the same path. I've worried about this a lot. And clearly there is a lot of parallels we can draw between Donald Trump and Viktor Orban or Erdogan or the Law and Justice Party in Poland and so on. Uh, so, I, so what can this sort of these broad experiences tell us about this moment? So I have three observations I wanna make. So first, so we've seen a lot of parallels in the last few weeks about Trump and authoritarian leaders. Uh, but I think there is a really big difference this time around, which is that successful autocrats don't actually lose elections. Uh, so what these leaders do is they hold elections, but they make sure in advance that, they, that the deck is stacked against the opposition, right? So they control the media narrative, they bully their opponents. In essence, they make sure they don't lose. Uh, and once they lose, they typically do leave office, right? So they try to rig the system, but ultimately commit to playing by the rules of the game, especially since they've worked so hard to make those rules work in their own favor. Uh, and this is a big difference because Trump clearly lost the elections. Uh, and I think this difference is important, right? So, so autocrats who, who follow the playbook, uh, they may get accused of rigging the elections or observers may say they weren't truly free or fair, but the major news outlets in charge uh, uh, or the major news outlets will not first announce that, uh, that they lost the election or those in charge of, of monitoring the election will not first announce that they lost. Uh, they will, the announcement will be that they won and then there'll be questions. Uh, so I think whatever Trump is doing now, it is not the 
authoritarian playbook that we've seen other in other countries where democracy has eroded. Um, so then second observation. So what would it take, you know, hypothetically for Trump to actually stay in office right now and not leave? Um, and I was thinking about this. Are there any analogies that uh, of other countries where leaders have successfully pulled this off after actually losing an election. Uh, and the closest I got was the Ivory Coast in 2010, uh, which is uh, where the incumbent lost the election. Uh, and then an independent electoral commission in charge of running the election announced that he lost the election, but then the incumbent refused to leave office. Uh, and two things happened. So first, the army at least initially supported the incumbent, which led to a civil war and ultimately military intervention by, interna by an international coalition. Uh, and second, uh, the constitutional court actually ended up supporting the incumbent's claim. So here they had an independent electoral commission, which is a different interesting discussion that comparativists are having right now. Many countries have independent electoral commissions that monitor elections, uh, even in federal systems. Uh, <coughs> and the US doesn't have such a single body. Uh, but in any case, uh, here the electoral commission said the president lost. And then the constitutional court stepped in and said, oh, actually the electoral commission decision missed the deadline. And then the decision, the, the constitutional court decision was highly problematic, but they said something like some votes in some regions weren't counted properly or these regions didn't count. Long story short, the incumbent won the election after all. And I think what this example shows, and it's kind of crazy that I have to resort to Ivory Coast examples because it's not exactly consolidated democracy, is probably two elements would have to be present for something like this to happen, right? First, a highly politicized army that is willing to put their loyalty uh, to the leader or ahead of their oath to the constitution or something like that. And armies are also very interesting. They have long been seen as uh, potentially threats to democracy, but there is this recent literature that shows they can really play an important role in maintaining and restoring democracy if it comes to it. Um, but okay, so that would be number one. And then two, a highly politicized judiciary that is willing to take a stance, partisan stance and overturn election results basically. Uh, so that it looks like maybe the elections were won after all, because I think that's what, what you would need. The only way to potentially play this is, is to to argue that you won after all. You can't stay if you clearly lost, but you could maybe make the case that after all, you did win. Uh, and in some countries, courts may be willing to do that for you, right? Some courts are regime helpers and they do that. Um, of course, I guess you would all agree with me that both of these are highly unlikely in the United States. We have a professional military that's unlikely to throw support behind the president who lost the election. Uh, I'd like to think courts are sufficiently independent, so that wouldn't happen. I mean, I guess the only potential wrinkle here is the scheme that Ross, uh, Professor Ross outlined uh, at the beginning where states could appoint their own uh, electors or something like that, which is a playing extreme constitutional hardball if you want, uh, but it seems all very unlikely. Okay, so third and last observation, and I'll end with that. Having said all that, I think Trump can still do an enormous amount of damage uh, to constitutional democracy with his claims, just the very claims that the election was rigged. So there is this very fascinating literature on the rise of populist or national populist, right-wing national populist movement, whatever you wanna call them exactly, uh, and, 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 and their link to conspiracy theories. So documented, and there's many examples of how, how these movements really thrive on conspiracy theories. Uh, so the work of Anne Applebaum or Timothy Snyder, amongst others, have, has documented this. So for example, after World War I, uh, Nazi politicians in Germany said they lost the war uh, because of leftists and Jews, um, not because they actually just lost, which was the case. There was no real evidence to, but, uh, to, to, to boost it, uh, to, to back this up. But this became a thing and it started le leading a life on its own. Uh, or in Poland right now, where there is a really big right-wing nationalist movement. And they have this conspiracy theory about this plane crash that happened whereby the, uh, the former president and many politicians died. Uh, there's really no evidence to, to, to say, to back up the claim that the president was assassinated, but yet many people believe it any day, anyway. Uh, so the thing is about these conspiracy theories, they can be really powerful. They can really bolster these 
movements. Uh, and for those who believe in them, no real evidence is needed. And I think Trump really gets this. He's not trying to back up any of the claims he's making. He doesn't have to. Uh, but they can really help build and, and, uh, and as I said, energize a movement. And I think that's maybe what Trump is doing. Uh, we already had some crazy stuff like pizza gate and birderism, and now this claim that the election is rigged, uh, uh, I think it can energize his supporters uh, going forward. So I guess that's what I'm most worried about. I mean, he will leave office, there's no other way, uh, but Trumpism or whatever you wanna call it will remain a force going forward. Uh, and I think these, this, these claims about rigged election, these conspiracy theories, they sort, these movements thrive on those kind of conspiracy theories, I think. And that's all I had to say. I don't know if that's positive or negative take on the events. Thank you, Mila, I really appreciate this. Okay, so let's bring back all of our panelists and um, let's kick off with this question. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so if any of you have questions in the audience, please feel free to, to send them, but here are a couple. So let's kick off with this. Um, on the one hand, one of the issues that we worried about at the very beginning was at the very beginning of the election was um, that in, our institutions would not perform well, in particular the courts and the assumption that courts would be partisan uh, and that judges would simply rule in favor of courts. And in fact, uh, Trump himself said that he is appointing justices of the Supreme Court and that they will deliver the election to him. And then the other related assumption were that election, uh, election administration officials would also behave in a partisan manner. That's one of the lessons, for example, that some took from the Bush v. Gore saga in 2000. What we've actually seen so far is that courts are behaving um, exactly as we would expect them to. Um, they are asking for evidence. And when they're not seeing evidence, then they are throwing out claims that are not based, that have no basis in evidence. Uh, so it doesn't make a difference whether the, whether the lawsuit is being filed in state or fed court, whether it is a Republican appointed judge or a, a judge that was elected um, in, in state courts as in, in a partisan or nonpartisan way. None of those things matter. They're behaving as neutral arbiters. And we're also seeing the same thing with respect to um, election administration officials. In fact, we're even seeing some of it with respect to um, elected officials, for example, the, the leaders of the state legislature, Republican state legislature in Pennsylvania, um, taking off the table relatively early on the idea that they're going to appoint electors. So on the one hand, we could see that, Amer that American institutions, the ones that we count on, that we were worried about at the beginning of this election, are behaving quite admirably and that the institutions are standing up um, and performing their function. Now, on the other hand, we also worry, and, and especially from um, Jack and, and Mila's um, um, presentation that there are that there are soft spots um, in our processes in which there's room for um, a person, an undisciplined, um, narcissistic, perhaps autocratic person with, with these types of tendencies um, to really undermine our processes. Um, so um, are there places, are there other ways in which our institutions can fight against these types of tendencies and particularly for you as well, Mila, are there um, uh, lessons from the comparative and international perspective of ways that institutions have fought back, um, right? So we see how institutions in this particular case, the courts and election administrators um, have actually not, not bended. Um, so do we have reason to believe that um, there's hope in this transition moment as well as in the post-election moment. What are the types of institutions that you may be counting upon or that you're worried about um, that, um, that may either fight back or maybe bend to the will of even an out of power autocrat? All right, so let me just do, uh, when I, I'll start with you, Kate, um, and I'll go to you, Jack, and, and, and Mila, and then Batral, you will last. Um, sure. Well, I want to give others a chance to weigh in. Let me just make a couple of observations. One, um, I do think that election administrators have performed remarkably and surprisingly well. So you see um, Secretary of State Raffensperger in Georgia, who has been uh, remarkably um, strong in his resistance to what feel like partisan pressures to 
you know, skew uh, or modify the results of the ongoing Georgia audit, um, including from some through some pressure from Senator Lindsey Graham just reported on yesterday. Um, but it is just dumb luck, it seems to me that we seem to have people of integrity and principle in these uh, offices. And so one obvious and, you know, kind of um, comparative point is that partisan election administration is to most of the world a ridiculous, ridiculous feature of American democracy, and that clearly nonpartisan should be running the show when it comes to elections. And again, it is, um, it, it is shocking. I mean, it is wonderful, but it is not inevitable that we are in a position in which we mostly have people of principle and, of, and integrity, it seems, uh, deciding these matters. And, and then the one other thing I'll say about courts is that I actually agree that so far we are seeing, even in a moment in which the president is doing everything in his power to appear to politicize the courts and the Supreme Court in particular, courts acting in a pretty nonpartisan fashion, right, demanding reasoned, uh, you know, reasoned argument and facts and evidence um, in a way that distinguishes the kinds of arguments you can make in the political sphere from those you can make in courts. Um, and that I think is also um, uh, suggests that courts remain an impor important guardrail. But I will say that the Supreme Court's performance in the pre-election period, I think, was quite mixed. And it is only, uh, I think, because the Supreme Court has not, in fact, had occasion to weigh in the post-election period in any substantive way that we can make the kind of provisional assessment about courts' performance. I have less confidence that we'd be saying the same thing if the Supreme Court had gotten into the mix. And so I'm, I'm glad that in fact, so far, it has not. Thank you, Jack. I don't really have anything to add. I mean, I just view what you said, Guy, as evidence that our institutions have worked remarkably well. I mean, I'm not an election law expert, but I don't think it's dumb luck. I mean, I, I think that there are norms that permeate these institutions, which is not to say they can't be co-opted, not to say they can't be abused, but um, what we're seeing now is actually you know, the institutions worked better during the Trump administration than they were given credit for. The courts worked better. Even the Justice Department worked better uh, in standing up to Trump's assaults than it was given credit for. And so I'll just say, you know, I, again, I'm worried, as I said, about the things Trump himself can do within his within the Oval Office and exercising his hard power. But I'm, um, but I'm do really- do you think people in the executive branch will cooperate if Trump decides yeah, to- I, 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 Sorry. Go ahead. I'm done. Go ahead. It, it, it depends. I mean, the the hard is, you know, if he asked the military to send the troops out in the streets under some insurrection ra act rationale, I don't believe that they will do that. A harder question is something closer to his clear legal authority to use military force. I mean, according to the new story this morning, there was pushback from the Pentagon. But if Trump puts his foot down and orders it, that's going to be an interesting constitutional drama, I think. But I do think, I mean, look, just one example for people who think that norms don't work and that Trump hasn't been pushed back against by his closest associates, I urge you to read volume two of the Mueller report, where time and time again, Donald Trump tried to get various senior officials that he appointed to senior positions in the Justice Department and the White House to fire Mueller, get rid of Mueller, stop Mueller. None of them would do it. And there, we've never had a presidency that, that featured more insubordination of senior officials than this one. And that doesn't give complete comfort for all the crazy things he can do during the transition, but it gives me some comfort for the more extreme things. Thank you, Mila. Great, yeah, so I, I agree with the main observation that the institutions seem to be doing what they should be doing, uh, though I do worry that some Republican leaders are not. Uh, but, but setting that aside, I think from, sort of a comparative perspective, there's this interesting debate uh, whether uh, there should be, or whether it's good for countries to have something like an independent electoral commission uh, that is nonpartisan and that runs the election and that announces the results. So I, it's seen a lot of op-eds uh, by Australians, like the Australian former uh, minister, uh, foreign minister saying, well, what the US really needs is what Australia has, which is an independent national electoral commission. Australia is a decent analogy because it's also a federal system, but yet they have this independent nonpartisan body Body that 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 runs the election and announces the result, and I, I mean, I, and there is something really odd about how this is this patchwork of states doing this in the U.S. And then, I mean, I got all these text messages from friends in abroad in election night. Why do the major news outlets decide who won the election? I'm like, well, they don't really decide, but they kind of decide. But what people are used to is is getting you know the, the independent national commission announcing who won the election. At the same time, I'm a little bit torn about 
like imagine we could rewrite the US Constitution or have some major reform along these lines, right? I'm, I'm a little bit torn about whether it's actually better in the sense that it may be easier to deal it for somebody like Trump to delegitimize and, and undermine the credibility of a body that's like expert, nonpartisan experts, right? I mean, what are Trump supporters are gonna think about those versus you know the state of Texas <laughs> that had done all they could to uh, to f suppress votes as much as they possibly could, but then they still had to. Well, yeah, I guess they, Texas may not be a good example, but like Georgia or something like that, right? So in some ways, I think there is some strength in having this crazy patchwork of running elections at the state level, uh, but but there is the, there is this debate that may be of interest. The Trump. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just kind of reinforce some of the things that Professor uh, Bristi described in terms of the, the election shows the benefit of a decentralized process. It's it's hard to co-opt um, so many people. Uh, there's many more people that you need to co-opt in order to successfully, um, you know, engage in, in election shenanigans, although it, it has and, and will continue to happen. But one thing I will say in terms of institutions, one institution that has not held up well um, is Congress, and particularly Republican Congress members. And one of the things that I wonder is whether the pathway by which Trump has influenced and co-opted Republicans in Congress might be a playbook that could be used for other institutions, right? And so, or is Congress sui generis? Is Congress just unique? And so, you know, if Congress is not unique, then what I imagine is, you know, future leaders in the Trump vein might try to use his playbook to influence, better influence these other institutions that have held up well during this particular election and transition. Um, but if it is unique, then perhaps that concern is, is unwarranted. Yeah, we have time for a couple more questions. One from uh, the chat, um, and I think this one is better directed to you, Jack, but although any of you can jump in, which is how would Trump pardon himself before he is convicted of a crime? Don't have to be convicted to be pardoned. At least he, he can pardon someone uh, and cleanse them of or lift any criminality from their record, future criminality without there being a crime, a crime committed or a, tri or, or a conviction. That's a settled aspect of the pardon power. The, the, un, the unknown aspect is whether he can do that to himself. Uh, the Constitution doesn't speak to it directly anyway. Scholars across the, or all over the map. I will just say that the Justice Department actually in the 1970s, in an OLC opinion, actually said the president can't pardon himself. They provided no analysis. They just basically said that, uh, this is a quote, no man can be a judge in his own case. I'm not sure if that analysis is, is the right analysis, but you don't have to be convicted to be pardoned. Thank you. Got two questions, one for Batrol um, and Kate, and then one for Mila. Uh, so the Batrol and Kate question, can you talk about the Pennsylvania challenge of the mail-in ballot deadlines that might make its way again to the Supreme Court, specifically if there's a strong argument that voters relied on the state's interpretation of state law to cast mail ballots closer to election day. And Mila, your question is, do lifelong appointments prevent courts from becoming politicized? Some argue that our Supreme Court has become fairly politicized with originalists, typically aligning together and liberals doing so as well. So we've got just a couple minutes left if um, you, the three of you would be quick um, and then we'll give you a last word and we will wrap up. So I'll just Charlie, yeah, please go ahead. Dan. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, um, so um, there is, these lawsuits were filed before the election. So ordinarily there would be a claim based on reliance interests under the doctrine of latches in which um, if this lawsuit was delayed and not brought until after the event, there could be an argument that the reliance interests of the voters was, was impeded or, or um, uh, undermined by this particular lawsuit and seeking to undercut or to dismiss their votes. But this lawsuit was brought before the election, it was just um, the Supreme Court just refused to intervene and said it might revisit it again after the election. So there is a viable claim that could be um, brought and the court could potentially find that these suits are invalid, but they would have to do so on the basis of a rather expansive interpretation of the Constitution as, as interpreting the Constitution as one in which only legislatures can make determinations about elections to um, or up to the presidency and that if the, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania cannot rule otherwise because this is a state Supreme Court ruling on the basis of their constitution that they will allow um, individuals to cast election ballots that are so long as they're um, um, so long as they're postmarked by election day. Sorry. Sorry, Kate. 
Oh, I was going to say the good news is that there's only probably about 10,000 ballots in this status that is sent by Tuesday and arrived by Friday and thus valid under the state Supreme Court's interpretation of the state constitution. And Biden right now is up, by, I think, over 60,000 votes in Pennsylvania. So there's no way, whatever the Supreme Court did, even if it adopted this pretty aggressive theory that Bertrand was just describing, there's no way it would change the results in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Mila, you get the last word. Okay, well, so do lifetime appointments help? Probably, but there is a lot of ways that courts get captured around the world and turned into regime helpers. Uh, there's many crazy examples. Uh, even courts, Supreme Court that have lifetime appointments, uh, countries, I mean, leaders, they can intimidate justices. Oh, a move they made in Poland was to lower the retirement age so that a lot of them were forced to retire. Uh, there's threats of jurisdiction stripping. So yes, probably they can, it can help, uh, but there is also many moves that, uh, that governments can make to undermine independence of courts and politicize them. It's a big discussion. I, I guess I don't have time to, to get into that. You know, this has been an amazing panel. We could talk to you all for you know hours, if not days. Thank you so much for taking the time to virtually join us here at Duke Law School. Um, we so much appreciate having the benefit of your intelligence and your wisdom. Uh, thank you to everybody else for joining us. I hope everyone has a peaceful and restful uh, and wonderful day. Take good care, everybody. Thank you, Guy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.